Okay. Wrong. Right. So, welcome everybody to today's webinar in the uh, Global Health Compound Design Seminar Series. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Gemma Nixon, who will be giving today's talk on heterocyclic quinolones um, and their discovery at the University of Liverpool at how these represent a privileged pharmacophore for targeting both TB and malaria. Um, I've known Gemma for a long time since she was doing her PhD uh, and was uh, extremely pleased to see that she was appointed as a lecturer at Liverpool uh, about two years ago. Um, she, the group uh, are well known for their work in malaria and also in ABLE2 and, um, I, shall, and I shall hand her, the floor over to her so she can tell you all about her work um, on heterocyclic quinolones. Over to you Gemma. Okay, thank you Caroline. Um, okay, as Caroline said, I'm going to talk to you um, about heterocyclic quinolones um, and they're targeting both TB and malaria. The majority of the talk will be on TB because that's the most developed side of the project. Um, we've recently revisited them for malaria, so I'll tell you a little bit about that towards the end of the talk. Um, just for those of you who don't know much about TB, I will briefly introduce the disease. Um, TB is a contagious wasting disease um, caused by infection with the rod-shaped bacteria that you can see in the picture down here. Um, the most common form is found in the lungs, and that's probably what you'd know most about TB. Um, you do get other um, organs that are infected. Um, you also get CNS TB as well. Um, symptoms are chest pain, cough, weight loss, pallor, fever and night sweats um, and it's transmitted from person to person by um, inhalation of respiratory droplets so if someone with TB has a cough um, they, it can easily be transmitted to somebody else. Um, most people who have suppressed immune systems um, it's more of a problem within people with suppressed immune systems and um, they are more likely to develop active tuberculosis um, what you will find is that if you breathe in a droplet and you are immunocompetent that your lungs um, will normally sort that out the macrophages will engulf it and um, hopefully get rid of it completely or you can have a dormant form of TB so you can have TB within your lungs without really knowing that you've got it um, in patients with compromised immune systems though that often develops um, into an active infection Tuberculosis is um, a global problem, as you'll see from the map. Um, it's most prevalent um, in South Africa and Indonesia. Um, the prevalence is um, obviously concomitant with um, areas of high HIV infection and where HIV infection isn't particularly um, well treated um, or controlled. Um, the current treatments for TB, um, you take a two-month course of all four of the drugs here, so isoniazid, rifampin, ethambutol and pyrazinamide. You then take a four-month course of just isoniazid and rifampicin um, twice a week. So it's a six-month treatment, which is quite prolonged, um, and that's for um, drug-sensitive TB. Um, we have obviously the emergence of multi-drug resistance and extensively drug resistant TB and those treatment times can then extend to up to 18 months to two years and you then tend to have to, to fall back on the second line therapies. Those second line therapies are second line largely due to toxicity um, and their mode of administration. A lot of them are given um, by injection rather than orally so they're not ideal treatments. You'll notice on the slide as well, these dates here are when these drugs first came to the market. So the current treatments for drug sensitive TB are old drugs that were developed in the 1950s and the 1960s. There's been a little bit of development um, in recent times. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, for um, with new drugs coming to the market, Dalamanid and Bedaquiline um, were FDA approved in 2012. Um, their use, however, is strictly re restricted to um, the treatment of MDR-TB, where those current second line therapies have already failed. Um, one to try and help prevent resistance to these drugs, um, and there are also some toxicity issues associated with the drugs, so they're trying to minimise dosage. Um, I mentioned MDR and XDR-TB briefly. Um, you will see here um, that again they're both very prevalent um, with um, XDR-TB being particularly prevalent um, in Russia. 
um, and you will see that there are these the red dots are cases of XDRTB. And you'll see that this is prevalent um, worldwide, with cases several cases in Europe um, and the UK. So this turned um, our attention to the respiratory chain of MTB. Um, so in order to try and slow down or prevent resistance development to drugs, we're essentially aiming for drugs that target um, a new biological target um, that's not already out there because obviously the, the TB hasn't come across those before and doesn't yet have the pathways around um, to develop resistance. Um, our attention turns to the respiratory chain because um, we've done a lot of work with malaria and the um, respiratory chain within malaria. And obviously, that's a validated drug target um, with, for example, a tovaquone, which hits the BC1 of the malaria. Um, so we turned our attention to um, tuberculosis to see if we could affect um, the same uh, kind of, of um, biological effect by targeting um, the MTB electron transport chain. Um, within, sorry, uh, within um, the um, electron, um, within the respiratory chain of tuberculosis, there are two enzymes, the NDH enzyme here and the BD enzyme here, um, that are both essential for dormancy and replicating forms of TB. Um, so hitting this should take out the replicating form and those dormant forms that, that reside in the lungs. Um, neither of them are found in the human electron transport chain, um, so this should give us um, selectivity and reduce toxicity. You will see that there are two pathways in effect as your the standard respiratory chain um, and also an alternative terminal oxidase pathway um, that has the potential to kick in. Um, if they need it. This will become important as we go through because I will return to this later on in the talk. So the, our project essentially started off by targeting um, the NDH enzyme. How do we go about this? Um, there are two known inhibitors of TBNDH. They are trifluoroperazine and thioridazine. And um, we used a cheminformatics approach and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, to essentially mine the biofocus library um, and we selected from, I think it's a library, 350,000 compounds, 10,000 compounds that we deem to be worthy um, of screening based on the structures of the um, known inhibitors um, and modifications thereof. Um, in addition to this, we did a limited um, in-house um, NDH screen on our quinolones from the, from our malaria projects. Obviously, we knew that there was likely to be some crossover um, in terms of biological activity. I would say what we have found though is that the structure activity relationship for TB activity is very different to malaria, and you will see that as we work our way through. This generated us 100 hits across four different templates. Um, you will see here a few key examples. Um, we had moderate TB activity um, with compounds that came from, um, so this is whole cell TB activity here in terms of the IC50, the compounds that came from um, the Biofocus library. The quinolones were slightly better um, in terms of biological activity against the whole cell, um, and this compound in particular was very potent against NDH. So having assessed these, we put this into um, an application for MRC DPFS. Um, they were keen on the project and funded it, but advised us from this point forward to drive the project on um, whole cell MTB kill. For this reason, we then focused back in on the quinolones. Um, we then completed a full um, in-house screen um, against the whole cell TB of our 400 strong um, quinolone library. From this, we got 90 hits over three sub three different quinolone subtemplates, and we selected RKA307 and RKA310 um, as the template with which to progress. Um, there were only two examples like this within the library, um, but they both had um, very good um, MTB IC50s, so 1.5 micromolar and 730 nanomolar as a starting point for lead optimization. Okay, so I said I talked to you a little bit more about the chemoinformatics approach um, for the HTS. So I'll, I'll do that now before we move on to the lead optimization. Um, 
the Biofocus Library is 500,000 strong. Um, we, or Neil Berry, I should say, who's a computational chemist here at Liverpool, um, did a substructure and turbo similarity search um, to get 934 compounds that looked like the, um, the initial inhibitors that we had. Um, they were then screened for NDH activity and this gave us 24 active compounds. This information from the actives and the inactives was fed back in then um, into another chemoinformatics selection process um, and from that they were able to get just over 10,000 compounds um, that they thought were most likely um, to lead us to good targets in both in terms into, into good templates, both in terms of um, their activity against the enzyme, um, and we were also able to use in silico um, admet um, assessments of these compounds to essentially try and generate the most drug-like compounds possible from the screen. The high throughput screen um, was then used um, to screen the 10,000 compounds. From this, we got 498 preliminary hits. We then did hit confirmation, um, which gave us 105 confirmed hits, um, which gave us, they, they were then um, assessed in terms of IC50, so that we had full IC50 curves on them. Um, that gave us 39 actives. These were then combined with the 24 from the initial screen. Um, and we had 63 hits, um, which were then assessed and progressed. Um, into the medicinal chemistry. So we then sat down and looked at those and decided what we'd work on um, and what we'd use for the DPFS application. So going back to um, what we wanted to find out in terms of the SAR on the quinolone template that was selected for lead optimization, that's up here just to remind you. Um, we knew a reasonable amount um, from the actives and the inactives of those 400 compounds that were screened. Um, what we knew was that maintaining this quinolone core was essential. Um, if you move to the quinoline and have an O-alkyl, for example, we lost potency. Um, questions that weren't answered, obviously, I said there were only two examples with that specific side chain. Um, so there was a lot of optimization and we tried a lot of different substituents um, in terms of optimizing the side chain. What it what did appear from the screen was that if you modified ring C, you seem to lose um, TB potency. Um, we also wanted to check to see if the methyl group was optimal. If you moved to um, chlorine, bromine, or removed it all together, what was the effect in terms of TB activity? And we also wanted to look at the optimal arrangement of substituents on the A ring. So there's just there's only two chemistry slides within the whole presentation, but just to very briefly talk you through um, how we made these compounds. We started with the um, isotoic anhydride here, some of which are commercially available, others which were relatively easy to synthesize in three fairly straightforward steps. Um, we then react with the 2-amino, two 2-methylpropanol two um, and zinc chloride to give us the oxazolidinone. Um, in terms of making the side chain, um, we started with the ethyl ketone um, with the fluorine substituent here. We were then able to react with the corresponding amine pot carb reflux overnight to give us the desired side chains. I should say for some of the side chains, we had to use alternative chemistry, but the majority of them were made in this way. We then did the ring closing reaction um, to afford the quinolone. Um, in reasonable yields. We did carry out quite a lot of lead optimization for this. Um, the reagent of choice was the um, trifluoromethyl um, sulfonic acid um, with then butanol. We did try different acids and different bases, but this gave us the optimal yield in the majority of cases. So in terms of the SAR, there's quite a lot of data in these tables, and I would say this isn't certainly isn't all the compounds we made either. There's a publication that's just come out in JMEG Chem um, that's referenced further on. So if you are interested in having a look at the full scope of everything that we made, I'd, I'd recommend you go and have a look at that. I'm just going to talk you through sort of the key SAR um, that led us to our kind of next steps within the project. Okay, so we have um, the two hit compounds that came out the screen um, were um, the proton, the seven um, 
with the proton here and the 7-methoxy. So we then started a series of different modifications to look at the different substituents around the A-ring. And the optimal substituent with the 5-fluoro was the 5-fluoro 7-fluoro. In terms of other things that we looked at while we were investigating this, we investigated the nature of Y here. Um, we found essentially, you'll see you look, as you look down, if you convert the methyl group just to um, a hydrogen, you lose TB activity. If you can then convert that to um, the chloro, you maintain some activity, but it's, no, it's nowhere near as potent as the methyl. Um, the bromo in the majority of the cases, um, we lost TB activity, although there was this, there's one sort of um, exception to that case, which is there. We also looked at substituting at this position here on the amine, um, so just leaving it um, as the proton or substituting to the fluoro compound. Um, and what we essentially found um, is that both are tolerated, um, the better potency was achieved with the proton in that position. Um, but that kind of sparked then um, as looking in much more detail at the amine that, that could potentially go on that side chain there, um, which moves us on to the second table on that slide. So we've locked in um, the 5,7 difluoro arrangement here, and we're looking at various different R groups. Um, what we found in terms of SAR trends here is that anything bigger than a methyl group um, at the 4 position on the piperidine um, resulted generally in loss of, of anti-TB activity. Um, if we move that round to um, the three position, we, a lot more was tolerated um, at the three position um, in terms of size. Um, we could also um, have smaller groups and larger groups at that position and maintain the activity. We tried to move this round to the meta position, so to here, um, and lost anti-TB activity. So from this, we had a reasonable idea of the space that was there. Um, we also obviously looked at chirality here with 15G and 15H, um, and it didn't make an awful lot of difference in this case. We then um, moved on to a slightly more extensive range of amines, um, and the two kind of key um, advances um, that helped us out um, substantially um, was the incorporation of the pyrrole here, um, which gave us good um, anti-TB activity, um, and also um, the difluoro compound here, um, again, maintained um, very good anti-TB activity. And these compounds proved to be key when we started to look at the metabolic stability um, of these compounds, which was the next step. We should say, interestingly, we talked about chirality before um, with the piperidine structure. When you have a slightly extended chain and the alcohol, we found the big difference between um, the two um, enantiomers here, uh, going from 30, uh, 0.32 micromolar to 1.59. Um, we did, however, find with these compounds that they were subject to metabolism, as you might expect, um, so these weren't pursued any further. So just to um, summarise the SAR that we found before we move on to the sorry the slides before we move on to um, the further in vitro data because obviously we then started to look at these in terms of in vitro DMPK. Um, the five fluoro seven fluoro um, was the best compound. The six fluoro seven methoxy was also reasonably active. But as you work your way down to the sort of the monohalogenated, so the seven fluoro and the seven fluoro, they're not particularly well tolerated. So the fluoro in the five position must be giving us some advantage in terms of um, interactions. Um, the methyl group proved to be optimal at Y. Um, a proton was required at R. And as I said, we can ring it contract and expand. There's not much room to manoeuvre at the four position, uh, but the three position is well tolerated in terms of modifications. Okay, so we had our leak compounds. We then obviously needed to start to look a little bit further um, in terms of their um, in vitro toxicities um, and their metabolism. And I'm just going to talk you through um, the different assays that we carried out. Um, you will see here um, we've got compounds 38D and 42A, um, which are essentially um, a difluorinated analogue of the pyrrole. You remember the pyrrole was active. Um, what we found 
when you die fluorinated is that you actually lose the activity which was a shame because in terms of metabolism they were rock solid whereas you'll see at the top those initial analogs that were made um, had very quick um, very short half-lives and very rapidly turned over um, another advance and I'm going to talk you through the, the stages of the our um, imparting met metabolic stability on the next slide um, but the other compound that gave us the advantage was this di 3 difluoro compound here and you'll see that we have good um, MTB potency um, and good um, and longer half-lives so this is that in a bit more detail it takes you through the kind of our train of thoughts as we did it so we have the initial compound the initial hit here MTF410 with very rapid um, turnover. Obviously, you saw the pyrrole on the previous slides, which maintained the efficacy, and we had slight improvements um, in microsomal half-life, but they weren't really significant enough. Um, at the point we made MTD430, getting the um, microsomal data back um, was actually quicker than doing the TB assay, because the TB assay is two weeks. Um, and we were very excited at this point. We thought we'd cracked it. A week later, however, when the TB data came in, we were bitterly disappointed. Um, we'd lost TB activity. We then turned our attention back to this ring and whether we could, and we knew we could shrink it and whether we could fluorinate to try and prevent the metabolism. We made the monofluoro here, um, which had really good um, anti-TB activity, um, but again, those turnover times were far too quick. Um, we then incorporated the second fluorine, and this actually made a really big difference in terms of um, metabolism. We lost a small amount of potency, but not much, enough that we could tolerate. And all the half-lives were above 60 minutes um, in the different microsomal assays. So you've got human, mouse, and rat. Um, so this then became the lead compound, really. We did assess others in terms of other assays, and I'll talk you through those in a second. Um, but this became the lead for further development. Okay, other um, forms of assessment for these compounds that we use were CACO2 permeability, obviously to check that, and they all they were all fine. Uh, we looked at stability in plasma. Um, again, they were all rock solid, no problem there. Plasma protein binding was um, round about what you'd expect for these kind of compounds and shouldn't cause us a problem. We have worked with quinolones for many years and they are notoriously insoluble and we knew we'd run into issues in terms of solubility. Um, we looked at a prodrug approach, which I'll talk to you a little bit about um, shortly. Um, but yeah, you can see the solubility values, um, particularly for those where we've, we've sorted the metabolism issue, um, aren't brilliant. Um, but the prodrug approach partially got us around that, as we will see as we go through. Other um, assessments, obviously, we looked at aqueous solubility. Um, this data, um, all the data on here was done retrospectively and generated at AZ, which is why the values differ slightly um, to our in house assays. But essentially, what this does is it tells the same story. Um, we have an aqueous solubility issue, plasma protein binding is fine, the log D is around about where we'd expect and yeah this performs the best um 42a which is mtc 420 performs the best in terms of um turnover um both in the microsomes and the hepatocytes in this case mtc 420 the synthesis of the side chain in this case was slightly different um, we started with the um, bromo ketone we reacted it with um we did an aromatic Finkelstein um, to convert the bromo to the more reactive iodo. Um, we then coupled in um, the amine using the book called Hartwig reaction. Um, this gave us the side chain, and then we just we used the conditions I described before to ring close. Um, as I said, we knew we had a solubility issue, so we were always had one eye on making a prodrug of the compound. Um, we did this. Um, using um, potassium tetrutoxide, acetyl chloride, um, to put the acetate group on here. You can see that proceeds well in a good yield. And I'll talk to you about how successful that was as we go through. Okay, so we started with both the parent and the prodrug in hand. We started to look at the pharmacokinetics of the compound. Um, you will see here the parent um, 
we dosed at 10 mg per kg initially. The bioavailability is kind of borderline on what we'd like, which is probably what we expected, bearing in mind the solubility. Um, when we increase this to 50 mg per kg, you can see you don't get a linear increase in terms of pK. Um, we think we have solubility limited absorption, which again, wasn't a huge surprise. Um, looking at the pro drug, and I should say for the pro drug, we obviously we dosed pro drug, um, but we measured for parent in the plasma. So it's parent levels that you are seeing um, in graph B. Um, what we found is obviously dosing at 10 mg per kg, we got a substantial increase in oral bioavailability. Um, when we increased to 50, though, again, that advantage wasn't linear, um, which was a little bit of a surprise to us and did trigger some further studies, which I'll talk to you about shortly. Um, so we were definitely getting an advantage with the pro drug, but it perhaps wasn't what we'd initially anticipated it might be. So at this point, um, this just summarises the biological profile of MTC420. In terms of our DPFS milestones and the values we were aiming for, at this point, this ticked all the boxes. Um, a couple of things that I've not mentioned already. Um, we ran these through the Wayne model of MTB. So that's a model that's used um, to assess um, the likelihood of activity in the dormant stages. It's not a perfect model by any chance, by any, any stretch of the imagination, but it's probably the most representative that's out there at the moment. Um, this gave us a good result. It was 76 nanomolar. Um, we were also lucky enough through Maxine Core's LSTM to be able to um, test the compound on two um, MDR TB isolates. And you'll see again, we maintain efficacy against the MDR strains, which again was good. Um, we talked about turnover permeability. Um, we looked a little bit at SIP inhibition. Um, it was clean with the exception of 2C8, but 38% of 10 micromolar was something we just need to keep an eye on, but it wasn't a, a showstopper. We looked at terms of in vitro toxicity. Um, it was the HEP-G2 um, was greater than 100 micromolar, um, which gave us a therapeutic index of over 190. Um, the HERG was greater than 25, which again was the maximum concentration tested, and it was AIMS negative. So at this point, we were in fairly good shape. This combined with the um, improved PK on the pro drug was enough to convince GSK um, to run the compound in their um, in vivo acute model um, of TB that they run in the mice which was where things started to um, go wrong. What we found um, was that in the mouse, sorry, what we found was in, in the mice, um, we had no in vivo efficacy. So this obviously was one quite large box, not ticked. Um, so we then, um, went back and we looked at two different things essentially to try and see if we could figure out why um, we had no activity in vivo. The first was to look at the metabolites um, and to see if there was anything there that would flag as to why we weren't getting activity. To be fair, what came back was as we were expecting, you get hydrox, you get conversion to the parent, which is what we wanted. You get hydroxylation um, on um, the uh, ring, which again was as we were expected, dihydroxylation, which again wasn't a massive surprise. What was more of a surprise um, was that the pro drug was found in the urine. So we're actually getting incomplete conversion um, to the parent compound. So what this essentially meant was that the mice were getting less of a dose of the parent compound than we thought. Um, this partially explains the lack of in vivo activity, but I don't think we were fully convinced at that stage that that fully explained exactly what was going on. So to complement this, um, we went back and did some additional in vitro studies um, looking at MTB growth. So your standard, um, there is no real gold standard TB assay. Um, none of them are perfect. The method that we had used um, up until this point was the standard Alamar Blue um, 96 well plate, different concentrations across the plate. It generates you a curve. Um, and then you can then read 
the IC50 value off it. This is a 14 day um, assay and you can see, you see the TB um, kill coming down. What we then went on to do was to look at these compounds in the midget assay. Now the midget assay is a different assay in that you have your TB, um, your drugs in there um, from the start and then you monitor the drug daily and um, you look at the fluorescence um, and you can see then whether the TB starts to grow up. It's a much longer assay, um, it goes out to 48 days um, and what we found here again explains the lack of in vivo activity. So if you look at these lines here, the green line that goes across is isoniazid, so that's your kind of gold standard. You'll see that the TB doesn't start to grow up when you treat with isoniazid. They're generally treated with um, either five times the IC90 or 10 times the IC50 um, in terms of drug concentrations, because you will notice that they are quite high. Um, the red line here is the control, so that's with no drugs that you see the TB after a few days starts to grow up um, and was obviously then maintained. What we found with MTC420 um, is that you get a delay in the TB starting to grow up, but at around about the 13 day point, it does then start to grow um, and it goes up to the non-drug levels, which obviously helps partly to explain um, what's going on in vivo. At this point we thought back to the um, respiratory chain um, and we postulated that if we were blocking NDH and taking out their standard respiratory chain that the TB was then able to kick in and use the alternative terminal oxidase pathway um, in order to replicate and survive. This then started um, a new train of thought in terms of combination therapies. Um, Giancarlo of LSTM had a student who was already looking at the BD enzyme and was already testing our malaria quinolones against it. Um, so we then started to think, well, if we, we had an, an NDH inhibitor and a BD inhibitor in combination, would that um, prevent the growth of the TB? So the compound that we used to test this theory, this theory was CK263. Um, you will see it's three um, nanomolar against the BD enzyme, so it's very potent against the BD enzyme. Its MTB activity isn't great, um, but it does have some activity. Um, so we looked at these drugs on their own and in combination. So I'll just take you through the different lines. Again, you've got isoniazid down here, which is behaving as it did before, with no TB growth. Um, you've got the drug, the no drug line growing up as you would expect. You see with CK263, which is the less potent against the MTB, you get growth slightly delayed from the no drug, but you still get growth back up. The same happens with 420, but a little bit later on, as we saw. However, if you give both these drugs in combination, you get the same flat line as isoniazid. So this kind of backed up um, the theories that we had. And it's kind of where we were, we're up to at the moment. Um, the new synergistic relationship seen in the midget assay has, has gone on to form the basis of a new project. Um, we've done a series of different um, combination studies that have formed the basis of a patent that's been put in now. Um, we're in the process of screening the full quinolone library against both NDH and BD to check that we've got the optimal com combination um, of inhibitors, we may well not, and there may well be another, a better combination out there. Um, we also have a proof of concept in vivo um, study in progress with the TB Alliance to see if what we're seeing in the midget tubes um, can be replicated in an in vivo situation, because um, that would that proof of concept will really then um, facilitate the project further. Okay, so that's kind of the TB and where we're up to with that at this point. Um, a lot of that was done, um, or the chemistry in particular was done a couple of years ago and we've just published it now. So that was kind of done before we had access to um, things like star drop um, and a lot of it was done manually in terms of how we progress. What we've done more recently is started to pick up um, these compounds in terms of malaria. And I'll talk to you a little about what we've done with that. Um, but again, with, with that now, we're starting to be able to use the tools such as Stardrop to help us decide what to make next. 
Okay, so malaria, I'm going to give you a really quick introduction um, for those who don't know uh, much about it. It affects 500 million people worldwide per year, 40% of the world's population are at risk. Um, one and a half million people die every year. Um, they're generally infants, young children and um, pregnant women who are most at risk. Um, the early symptoms include fever, headache, chills and vomiting. Um, and you can see in terms of its prevalence, again, um, it's the more underdeveloped areas of the world um, where they don't have um, brilliant healthcare facilities either, which doesn't help. Um, in terms of resistance, there is resistance to the current drugs. Chloroquine resistance has been known for a long time. Um, what is starting to emerge, which is perhaps more worrying, is emergent is um, resistance to um, the artemisinin combination therapies. Art ACTs are kind of the the mainstay of anti-malarial treatment, and um, we have um, started to notice resistance emerging to these. In terms of how is the disease transmitted? Um, the mosquito is transmitted from person to person by mosquito. Um, the mosquito will, when it takes a blood, a blood meal, injects sporozoites um, into the bloodstream. Um, they then enter the liver and the liver stage of the life cycle. Within there, they will grow and mature into merozoites, um, which are then released into the bloodstream. You then enter the bloodstream cycle where these merozoites replicate and grow. Um, to form a schizont. The, the schizont will then rupture and release more merozoites. They then have two potential pathways. One is to go on to reinfect other red blood cells and to continue the blood cell cycle. Um, the other is that they can then go on to mature into gametocytes, which is the sexual stage of the cycle. Um, these are then taken up by a mosquito that takes its next blood meal, and those gametocytes will mature within the mosquito into sporozoites, ready to be re-injected back um, at the next blood meal. So you can see there's a continual cycle um, of infection between the human host um, and the mosquito. Um, Plasmodium falciparum is the most widespread and dangerous form of the disease and you'll see as we go through we test against 3D7 um, which is the most um, which is um, a Plasmodium falciparum strain for that reason um, and it's the female Anopheles mosquito that does the transmission from person to person. So that's a bit of a whistle stop introduction to malaria um, but it covers the basics. So in terms of what we've done previously in terms of quinolones and the respiratory chain, we have an act, we had an active program some years ago now um, where we were initially targeting PFNDH2 within that respiratory chain. The compounds made also demonstrated activity against BC1, so we had dual inhibition. You'll see the difference between the malaria and the TB chain. Obviously, some of the enzymes are different, but they also don't have the alternative oxidase pathway. We started a project with um, HDQ, so that's the one known inhibitor of PFNDH2. Um, we then carried out a similar biofocus screen um, on against PFNDH2 because that's the most amenable um, to do large-scale synthesis and to, um, to actually running the HTS screen. We could make it in large enough quantities to carry it out. Um, that then led us to CK268, which is detailed in the Pudathala paper down here, um, which had good activity both against um, the parasite, um, the malaria parasite and PFNDH2. Um, it, wasn't, it didn't have the best DMPK, so we further developed this to SL225. Um, and we're able to partially negate um, the issues in terms of solubility by forming a salt. Um, so the data here is for the salt form, um, for the phosphonate salt form of the vessel 225. And you can see again, good efficacy against um, the whole cell parasite and the enzyme and reasonable ED50 and ED90 values. So those ED50 and ED90 values are the um, in vivo um, readouts for um, the malaria um, mouse model. Um, this was then further developed into PG227. Um, I apologise now for the blobs, this hasn't been published yet. Um, and you'll see here, we lose a little bit of the NDH2 activity, 
we gain more BC1 activity, um, but the ED50, ED90 values are really quite good for this compound. Um, so that's the stage we are at with the compound. The issues we've run into with this is getting enough drug on board to carry out the toxicity studies that we need to in order to, to prepare ourselves for candidate selection. So this has stalled. Um, Due to this, we decided we'd have a look back and screen all the compounds that we made in the TB project against malaria just to see if we, it gave us, a, gave us any advantage. This um, is the same diagram that you saw before in terms of improving metabolic stability. However, instead of MTB activity, um, you have 3D7 activity. So this is anti-malarial activity. You'll see all five compounds on there had some um, anti-malarial efficacy. Um, and you will see our attempts to make the compounds more solute, more metabolically stable largely resulted in active compounds. Particularly pleasing um, was um, the fact that the um, difluoropyrrole um, is a really quite nice anti-malarial 18 nanomolar. This work has been carried out relatively um, recently. Um, We've been lucky enough through a collaboration with AstraZeneca on another project to be able to run through some of these compounds um, through their in vitro DMPK. So this is actually measured data that you'll see here. We are also now starting to use um, Stardrop to predict um, the in vitro DMPK and to help us decide what to make next. Um, you'll see it looking at their DMPK properties um, in general, you can see these, there's another two difluoro analogues here, um, the 7-methoxy and the 6 chloro 7 methoxy Both of these had really good antimalarial potency at 10 and 30 nanomolar. The log Ds are where you'd expect. We have the aqueous solubility issue, as we would predict. Um, but in terms of turnover, they look really quite nice and solid um, with low clearance values um, and reasonable plasma protein binding. So this really forms the start of a new project to try and get enough of a body of evidence together to see if we have an advantage over PG227. Um, the TB quinolones, we obviously optimised um, for TB activity. So what we're trying to complete at the moment, um, and we're having to largely use master students and summer students to do this, um, is to complete the SAR against malaria, because there are some compounds that you would have made, obviously made looking at the SAR. Um, that we haven't um, because we weren't optimizing for malaria. So they're being completed. Um, we are then starting to look to see if we can improve the solubility. Um, solubilizing side chain is one approach we're looking at. Alternative prodrugs um, is something else that we've, we're starting to look at. Also seeing if we can alter the course slightly, because the issue with the quinolones and why that they're so poorly soluble is that they pi pi stack because they're very flat. And see if there's a way that we can break that flatness um, without losing um, anti-malarial activity. So that's something that we're starting to look at. Um, and we obviously also would need an in vivo proof of concept PKPD experiment to be carried out once we think we have an optimized compound. And that would then form the basis of a further funding application. Um, so that sort of summarises where we're up to with the malaria. I'd say that's much more recent data and isn't yet published. Um, just to acknowledge everyone that's been involved, there's been a bit of a cast of thousands over the years that have worked on the quinolones. Um, in terms of the chemistry, um, myself with Paul O'Neill and Neil, Neil Berry have led the chemistry side. Obviously, this has been done strongly in collaboration with LSTM, with Giancarlo Biagini and Steve Ward. Um, and Obviously, there's been a large number of people who've worked on both the biology um, and the chemistry side. And thank you all for your attention. Um, any questions? Thanks very much, Gemma. That was great. It was a real tour de force. Um, so if, if anybody has any questions, um, can they just unmute themselves? Um, or you can type into the box and I'll, and I'll, I'll ask Gemma. So whilst you're all having a think about that, it's my chance to ask a question. So, <laughs> so Gemma, you said that you were now using Stardrop, but you hatch, mm -hmm. actually have some some uh, real measured experimental data to compare against. Can you comment yeah. on how the predictions uh, fit with the measured values? 
Yeah, I think largely we've been quite pleased actually there does seem to be a nice correlation between um, the the measured data and the predicted data. Um, we use Stardrop and we also have access to AZ predictive and they agree with each other as well, you'd be pleased to know. <laughs> <laughs> and the measured data does seem to correlate with all of that as well. So we we now have a much, a much bigger wealth of data available than we did. It would have been really handy to have that at the beginning when we'd done the TV project. Um, but we are certainly, yeah, th there is a, a quite a nice correlation. Yeah. I have a question here from Alexander Minizis, who I've just um, unmuted, so you can ask your own question, Alex. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if, actually I have two questions. If the solubility is low in general, of a lot of these compounds, how reliable are the uh, biological data that you obtain, um, whichever the activity, HERG, etc. Um, and the second question I have in, in these disease areas, do you actually care about reactive metabolite formation or not? Okay, so I'll take your first one first. <laughs> okay, we've played about with these assays quite a lot um, and they, they are generally fine we don't have a problem we we tend to make sure that there's enough dmso in there because they are quite soluble in dmso so if you've got a small percentage of dmso in the assay and the majority of them will take that then it's not too much we don't have a problem we do monitor the assays very closely for compounds crashing out but we actually we actually haven't had much in the way of problems as long as the assay will tolerate a small very small percentage of dmso in there which the majority of them do um, okay. So that's fine. Um, in terms of your question about your um, rat data, etc., whilst longer term, obviously these are going to be used to treat humans. The issue is getting through the regulatory processes. You know, having developing the candidate selection data, etc., because they obviously have to go through the animal models to prove the in vivo efficacy, um, the toxicology, etc. So it's important that we know how like quickly they are turned over in the rats in the mouse so that we can generate that data package to get the compounds further along the line so that's why we we look at that closely okay thank you okay Gemma, i was really impressed with your um your co-dosing data <laughs> do you have any i'm sure you were as well um do you have any good ways of predicting um, mixtures of, of of compounds to, to use in that way? We don't, to be honest. It's it. I suppose, especially with it being TB, it's something that we've we've obviously recently discovered. We're in the process of playing about with different inhibitors that inhibit different components mm -hmm. of the chain. I don't think we have enough data yet to develop a predictive model. Or that's something that we would really like yeah. to do. Um, so yeah, it's something that we will probably look at in the future, but we're just, we're starting to build up the data to be able to, to do that, I think. Anybody else got any questions? No? Okay, last chance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think I think we should say a huge thank you to, to Gemma for going through all that data um, and uh, putting the talk together for today. Uh, it's been lovely to see. Um, uh, and before I let you all go, I shall show you, if I can switch the... Uh, Just trying to change this around. Make presenter with me. Do I need to do it from here, perhaps? Perhaps you can do that. Yes. Hang on. Yeah. There we go. Lovely. Good answer. Thank you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Can you see my screen, which has the advert yep. for uh, June's meeting, which will be on Wednesday, the twenty-first of June, uh, and we will have a talk from Vincent Zoita and Antoine Dana, who work for the Swiss Institute for, of Bioinformatics, which is a huge repository of web-based tools, which are all free to, to, for everybody to use. Uh, and they're going to talk in the first instance about Swiss Admi, which is a, a new web portal that they uh, launched at the beginning of this year. And they'll also tell you a little, about some, little bit about some of their other tools. 
Uh, and in September, they're going to come back and talk to us about um, SwissDoc and some of their tools for doing structure-based design. So I hope that you will be able to join us then. Uh, and thanks once again to Gemma. Um, and have a good evening, Paul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whichever part of the day you <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> Bye now. Thanks, everybody.